Good afternoon and welcome to ISIP South Africa's and ITTC's webinar, a title of which is Alcohol and COVID-19 in South Africa, an endless cycle of liquor sales bans being imposed and lifted or catalyst for meaningful action. Just a, a little bit of housekeeping, the, web, the webinar is scheduled to run from 3 o'clock to 4 p.m. Um, so the presentation should be about an hour. Please feel free to post any questions you may have during the course of the presentation in the questions portal you see on the top right of your screen. We should, we hopefully will have some time to respond. Should we not have time to respond, we will ensure that all of your questions are answered in a follow-up recording or um, by email. Right, let me introduce our presenter, uh, Professor Charles Perry. And we're very, very grateful that you've taken the time out of your extremely busy schedule to present this for us. Professor Perry is uh, the director of the Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drug Research Unit at the South African Medi Medical Research Council. He is a clinical and research psychologist and an extraordinary professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Stellenbosch University. His current research centers on alcohol and drug epidemiology, burden of disease and policy, alcohol use and HIV TB treatment, and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Professor Perry was trained in South Africa and the USA in clinical and community psychology, as well as mathematical statistics. And as such, he's published more than 280 indexed journal articles and co-authored three books on alcohol policy. Since 2006, he has been a member of the World Health Organization Expert Panel on Drug Dependence and Alcohol Problems, and in 2010 was appointed to the board of the Global Alcohol Policy Alliance. During 2020, his modeling of trauma presentations was used to inform government policy regarding the, implement, the imp imposition of the second ban on liquor sales in South Africa, which together with other interventions led to a dramatic decline in the burden from trauma in, uh, experienced by hospitals and freed up necessary resources needed to treat COVID-19 patients. Since April 2020, he's given over 170 local and inter international media interviews mostly on the topic of alcohol and COVID-19. Today he'll be presenting the, um, the webinar on alcohol and COVID-19 in South Africa. Just a little bit of background, the South African Medical Research Council Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drug Research Unit is now in its 20th year of, ex of existence. With about 20 plus core staff based in Cape Town, Pretoria, the focus is on a broad range of research focusing on the nature and extent of substance use in South Africa associated consequences and the multi-faced interventions aimed at addressing substance use. This webinar, however, will focus particularly on, uh, will focus particularly our understanding of the relationship between alcohol use and COVID-19 and local lessons learned. Not only about the linkages between drinking and trauma, but also what needs to be done to facilitate a different traje trajectory for South Africa in terms of our problem with heavy drinking. Professor Perry, very, very welcome. I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Roger, and to, to you all and ISAP for the opportunity to speak today. So I will hit off. You see the front page there and uh, moving on to what I'll be talking about. Just see if I can get it to move to the next slide. Uh, that's always a help. Okay, good. We figured out how to do it. Okay, so what I'm going to be covering really is four issues. First of all, briefly, I think it's important contextually to understand the burden experienced by uh, heavy drinking in South Africa and the drivers of such behavior and the relationship between alcohol and COVID-19 very briefly in, in one slide. Secondly, to understand the effect of the temporary liquor sales bans on trauma presentations and unnatural deaths. Uh, thirdly, to reflect on lessons learned from the temporary liquor sales bans, put some ideas on the table there. And finally, to talk about probably what's the most important topic is strategies to create a safer drinking environment in South Africa in the longer, in the longer term. So this is a, I, you can see I'm not an artist, but it's, it's uh, I just want to explain this in the sort of the direction which I'm taking. This is a river starting at the top, moving down to the bottom. And and what you'll see here is at the bottom, you, there's some people in the river who are in fact drowning. Um, 
So what I'm going to be giving this talk from the perspective of more of a community psychologist rather than a, a clinical psychologist, although I am one, the clinical psychologist would focus on the people who are in the river and, and just sort of bring them to the side and help them get on their feet and, and live empowered lives. The community psychologist, on the other hand, goes upstream to look at what are the factors that result in people falling into the river in the first place and why can't they, for example, get themselves to the side. So you might look, there's a, supposed to be a beach at the top there on the left. You know, what's happening there? Are people drifting into the current? Do we need to perhaps set some, some uh, um, flotation devices or, or, or measures to stop people drifting into the current? Um, also, higher up, a little bit in the middle, you'll see people standing on the edge. It's meant to be a cliff. Is someone pushing someone over? And what's happening there? We need to deal with that. So the focus of the talk today is mostly on looking at upstream drivers and of heavy drinking and how do we address them. That's not to negate the importance of the people who are struggling with addiction. And I know that's often a talk of, of the series. In fact, I felt very much that the government hasn't done much in South Africa during the pandemic, and especially during the times of liquor sales bans to, to reach out and to offer services to people who might be struggling with uh, alcohol withdrawal, addiction problems as a result of the, you know, as a result of, um, for example, the lack of availability of alcohol or other pressures. And I think we really need to do a whole lot more about that, making services available, uh, medications for those who might need um, who might need assistance with anxiety or naltrexone and things like that. But that's a topic for another day. I'm I'm talking about different things. So. Can you first of all talk about understanding the burden experienced by heavy drinking in South Africa? And this slide comes from the Global Status Report on Alcohol and Health 2018, a WHO publication. And what it shows, if we look at some of the columns there, that in terms of percentage of current drinkers, uh, the data shows that about 31% of adults in South Africa are current drinkers, which is substantially less than the world average of 43% of adults and just slightly lower than the Afro average. But I think it gets more interesting when we look at the adults per capita consumption per drinker in grams of absolute alcohol. Um, this is on average in an average day. It's 64.6 grams in South Africa, which is between five and six standard drinks per day per drinker. And that is double the world average. So that's the problem we have. We have a smaller section of our society who drink, and of those, um, on average, they're drinking a lot of, of pure alcohol. Uh, the next uh, last column also shows this with binge drinking, with 59% of South Africans engaging in binge drinking. Sorry, this is of binge of, of drinkers engaging in binge drinking in the past 30 days. That's nine percentage points higher than the world average, and roughly 20 percentage points higher than the Afro average. So that's, that's the problem we sit with, a heavy drinking problem. And that's, um, we've got drinkers who are engaging in binge heavy episodic drinking, and that's where we get a lot of the problems related to trauma and so on. And unfortunately, we also have sectors of the liquor industry which are also dependent for their profits on this, this proportion, heavy, high proportion of drinkers engaging in, in heavy drinking. We're not like a country like Spain, for example, where more people drink, but they, they have a much lower average per drinker. So what are, okay, this is some data from a study I conducted in, in Swane in 2015, which actually reports the percent of absolute alcohol consumed by different deciles of drinkers. And what you find is that, uh, if you look to the right-hand side, that the top 20% uh, of drinkers are in fact consuming 82% of the absolute alcohol. So that just confirms the WHO data. As part of this, uh, this study, we looked at the, some of the risk factors for heavy drinking. And these are some of the things that came up. Uh, container size, if you're drinking from larger container sizes, that's also a risk factor. You're um, eight times more likely to be a heavy drinker if you drink from a bigger container or you purchase a larger container. The drinking location is a risk factor. In fact, sports clubs is the highest risk factor for drinking too much. But if you're drinking in someone else's home, you have a 60% higher risk of being a heavy drinker than drinking in your own home. And a substantially higher risk also if you have with special events licenses. 
And we've talked about the above average size containers with uh, drinking from a larger container, for example, if you're drinking from a, 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 the average container for beer. In fact, well, the one we looked at for the middle was in fact the 330 mil container. So if you're drinking from a bigger container than the 330 mil, your odds of being a heavy drinker are six times higher. And then compared to drinking at home, drinking in nightclubs, uh, predicted heavy drinking amongst beer drinkers with a substantially higher adjusted odds ratio. So I guess it's been good that the nightclubs have been shut down during, during COVID-19. So looking at alcohol attributable deaths, uh, we fall into the second highest, second darkest blue category with between 6.2 and 7.8% of all deaths in South Africa can be attributed to alcohol. And there's a little bit of debate about how many per day. Uh, one of my PhD students uh, through one methodology showed that it's about 171 people per day of dying of alcohol related causes, uh, causally related. Another study due to come out shortly, but looking at a few years earlier, found it was only 102. So somewhere of that order. This is also from a from actually from a, another P, from a PhD student's work looking at the uh, um, deaths from alcohol in South Africa. And there are two two take home messages from this slide. One is that more men are dying of alcohol related causes than females. We obviously know that. And then the, within the genders, you'll see substantially higher um, uh, risk per hundred thousand for. Uh, when you're looking at the lower and middle SES levels compared to the higher levels. So for the same amount of alcohol, generally it's well known that uh, people from lower SES groups have worse outcomes. I know I'm going through these quite quickly, but I just want to make a couple of points. And then the other thing that we are very important when you're looking at alcohol is not only looking at mortality, but what we call morbidity. And that's obviously relevant when we're looking at trauma. So not only does alcohol play a ro causal role in people dying prematurely, it also plays a role in people having an alcohol-related disability. And this is a measure called DALI's, Disability Adjusted Life Years Lost, is a, a, a measure of the, the DALI's. And one of the things we do for the burden of disease estimates is look at the um, percentage of DALI's that are attributable to alcohol. And in South Africa, we fall in the band of 50. 5.5 to 6.6 percent of all disability adjusted life years lost. That's years lost from dying early or living with a disability that are due to alcohol. So it's causing a lot of, of a burden in, in, in South African society. So what's the relationship between alcohol and COVID-19? I'm sure you're all aware of this, but three things that really I want to emphasize here is that drinking undermines physical distancing and increases the risk, therefore, of community transmission. Obviously, there are other factors that do the same, but drinking does play a role there. Secondly, alcohol increases the risk of trauma presentations and unnatural deaths. And thirdly, there is a link between heavy alcohol use and immunity, especially lung health and immunity. So if you're a heavy drinker, you might not know it, but your lungs are more compromised. You're much more likely to acquire and have a worse outcome from COVID-19. So to the second area, and trying to understand the effect of a temporary liquor sales bans on trauma presentations and unnatural deaths. This is still being unpacked and um, there are issues that we're still grappling with, but let me take you through some of the data as I see it. We've had a complicated year. We're almost up to a year of the lick of the um, of the uh, um, what do we call it? The COVID-19 restrictions in South Africa, disaster management, ruling our lives, and we've had various levels there, and the dates are indicated, and I've indicated there. Um, what's happened for alcohol on consumption selling, alcohol off consumption selling in South Africa, and also the curfews, because the impact of, of um, the disaster management regulations has not only been through controlling alcohol, but obviously through controlling mobility. I'm certainly not going to deny that. We've had three lines that you can see there are in red, uh, yeah, red on yellow, and that's where we've had three periods where there's been a complete ban on liquor sales for on and off consumption in South Africa. We're the only country, as far as I know, to have had more than one period like this, and certainly the only one to have had three liquor sales bans. And um, there have also been several periods where there have been what I call 
partial bans uh, where there have been restrictions on the days of weeks uh, in which alcohol may be sold for off consumption and um, also certain restrictions on, on consumption. And uh, yeah, I can't really go into all the details there, but certainly the first period was when there was no restrictions. Then we had a ban and then where it says level three, we had um, a ban on, on consumption. Therefore you couldn't purchase alcohol on, at a restaurant or tavern, but you could buy it from Mondays to Thursdays from nine o'clock to five o'clock. Then we had the ban and then we've had it opening up and there were restrictions on off consumption, but with uh, on consumption was allowed, but there were various restrictions on the time period from at 10 o'clock and sometimes it was moved to midnight. Then at, on the 29th of December, we had another complete ban on liquor sales. And then from the 2nd of February, it's, it's opened up. And we have restrictions on days of the week for off consumption, only Mondays to Thursdays, 10 to 7 p.m. may alcohol be sold. And then um, at on consumption, there's normal restrictions, really. It's only defined by, by the curfew, which is now um, from 11 p.m. till 4 a.m. So here's some data. This comes from a paper published in December 2020 in the South African Medical Journal, Navsaria et al. And you'll see there's five lines, I hope the colors are coming across, which show data on, at Critiscuo Hospital, the trauma center patient admissions by the green is February, yellow is March, blue is April, uh, orange is May and red is June. So in the green period, there were no restrictions pre-COVID. The yellow period really only towards the end after the 18th of March were there some restrictions, particularly on, um, on alcohol sales. And then the April and May, there was a complete ban on on and off consumption selling of alcohol in South Africa. And on the 1st of June, for the whole of June, um, liquor sales were allowed. And what this graph shows, first of all, the total data, you'll see a substantial drop in trauma in, in March, in, in, in April and May. And uh, um, our contention is that's due to probably a couple of factors due to the restrictions on mobility and also on the, the sale of alcohol. It's, it's long known that there's a link between alcohol and trauma, but I'll unpack this in another slide to deal with some of the criticisms from the liquor industry. The next set of slides show for gunshot wounds, stabbings, blunt force trauma, and all violent trauma combined and road accidents, how the, how the, um, the drop was. So you'll see particularly there was a drop in violent trauma in uh, April and May. Also road traffic trauma, which you would expect because less, less people on the roads. So that's the, that's the first set of data that I want to present that the ban had a, the ban and, and, and the, the restrictions on mobility together had a combined, had a big impact on, on trauma, a dramatic impact. The next slide is something that hasn't been presented before. This is a, from a journal article that's um, under review. Um, that uh, it looks at rates per 100 days. So it takes into account the different lengths of the periods at a hospital called Worcester Regional Hospital. And you'll see there the three graphs. First is trauma admission rates. Then B is stab wounds. So it's a, a subsection of the trauma admission rates. And C is those who have trauma operations. So the numbers also, uh, where they actually have to have surgery. So let's just look at the first one, A, trauma admission rates. So there were 95 admissions in the uh, pre no ban period from the 1st of January to the 26th of March. Then it dropped to 39, which is a 59% drop. Then it increased by 90% on that lower level to 74, dropped to 40 in the uh, period um, uh, from the 13th of July to the 16th of August, and um, then increased again after the 17th of August. So, um, yeah, I'm just checking this again. Okay, yeah. So there were two periods of complete ban with where the admissions, trauma admissions dropped 
to 39 per, this is rates per 100, um, rates per 100 days, uh, the volume. And then, so you'll see it's pretty similar during the two band periods. And it rises after the first band was lifted, and then it rises even more. And the first band basically allowed, it was a partial it was a ban, uh, a partial ban only allowing um, off consumption sale. And the, th the, the last period on the right, which is 163% increase, was when they allowed both on and off consumption, but slight restrictions because of the curfew and also days of the week for or, or, um, off consumption selling. And they're statistically significant. In fact, what what um, I can't go into all the details, but compared to the ban periods, there was a statistical significance between the pre-ban periods and the partial ban periods. And, and in fact, what we also found was no difference between the partial ban periods and the pre-ban periods in terms of the rates per yeah uh, rates of trauma per hundred days. Um, so yeah, that's what we found. A very similar pattern for stab wounds and, and trauma operations. This data, next data comes from the Western Cape Sentinel Trauma Surveillance System, which is data on a daily basis from January last year, um, right through to currently. And it's from five large hospitals in the Western Cape province. What the first slide shows is data um, for the two weeks before and two weeks after the, the latest liquor sales ban on the 29th of uh, December. And what it showed was a 51% drop in trauma presentations. Um, immediately they instituted a liquor sales ban on the 29th of December. And my contention, which you know is disputed by some people, is that such a big drop, okay, from the two weeks before the 29th of December to the two weeks after cannot be explained entirely by the fact that there was a, the curfew was increased by two hours, I think from nine o'clock to 11 o'clock in the evening, and also two hours in the morning from four to six. And um, in the coastal areas, we didn't allow people to go on the beach, so obviously you'd see less drownings. Uh, and maybe there was a little less travel because people were driving to their destinations before Christmas and not after. But I, I contend that people were also going home within the two week period after the 29th of December. So I don't think that's relevant. And, and yeah, I'll be talking a bit more about that. So we saw a 51% drop in trauma presentations across the five hospitals after the ban was lifted and after they increased curfew by those those four hours, it was it was a dramatic effect. Um, similar data, but looking at um, the most recent data, which was for the week, uh, we've lifted the uh, most recent liquor sales ban. Um, yeah, and um, let's see after. The it's, it's comparing the week before the most recent liquor sales ban was lifted, when there was a ban, and then after the ban was lifted. And we saw a 105% increase in that week. Obviously, some of it in trauma, um, you know, and, and it really can't be explained dramatically by the fact that there were more people traveling in, the, you know, in that last week of January, early February, compared to, to early into the week of the 2nd to the 9th of February. Um, I think that's that would be be too much to expect. Obviously, they're probably in the week after a liquor sales ban is lifted, people are going out and, and buying buying alcohol. So that that's obviously explaining it. There's been a, a demand for alcohol, so it would probably drop down again in in the latest data. 105% is probably because things were a bit crazy after that the ban was lifted. People went out and and bought alcohol and drank more. So that's showing that when you lift a full liquor sales ban, you get a dramatic increase in trauma. The previous slide was saying when you impose one, they had a 50% drop in trauma. This one shows that when you lift the ban, you get a big increase in trauma. And then finally, these slides show um, the data comparing um, uh, May, when there was a full liquor sales ban on the left, with June, when that liquor sales ban was lifted. And you see a 49% increase after that full, full liquor sales ban was lifted 
and there was an imposition of a partial ban in which you could only buy alcohol four days a week from off consumption sales. The curfew remained the same between May and June. So you, you can't explain it in terms of, of people being restricted in their movement in that way. So just a few points here. It's been contended by the liquor industry as part of court papers that I've been going through that, you know, it's it's really due to mobility. And just want to put a few ideas on the table why I think that that's um, certainly no one denies that mobility plays a role, but I think to, to discount the fact that liquor bales, sales bans had any impact is, is going too far. And uh, if we want to test that out, we should just ask the government to impose a full liquor sales ban the next time and not to impose any restrictions on mobility. Or we say, um, don't impose the ban and, and leave the restrictions there. And we'll see how, how, how crazy things get when you've got trauma hospitals full and, um, and COVID-19 with a third wave. But I, I don't think that's those are serious propositions. So I think if you look at the Bradford Hill criteria for causality, the, you know, Parts of the liquor industry in the court case have, have argued that there's a confusion between causality and correlation. But I think when we look at the Bradford Hill criteria for causation, there are nine criteria, you can clearly see that alcohol is causally related to trauma. In fact, you know, there's a dose response. The more people drink, the more trauma there is. When you remove alcohol, the trauma goes away. Um, there's a biological pathway. What happens in the body when people drink, it, it increases inhibitions and so on. So I think if you go through those criteria, certainly you can certainly say there is a, a causal relation between alcohol and drinking. Um, there are certain problems uh, with using Google mobility. The liquor industry has used that uh, as a measure of mobility to say that really it's all about mobility and not about the liquor sales bans. But there are different measures of mobility and there's work mobility, there's residential mobility, and so on. And there's no clear idea of how you would actually weight those different types of mobility. And in fact, not everybody has their location data on. So you're probably getting more rich people. Poorer people are probably less likely to have their their location data on because then it means they're on with, with um, data all the time. Uh, and some forms of trauma are affected by mobility in opposing ways. Gender-based violence, for example, if people are restricted to their homes, you'll probably see more gender-based violence and more home-based trauma, whereas vehicular trauma will increase when there's increased mobility cars on the road. Certainly, there was a lot of anecdotal evidence by attending physicians that things went crazy after the liquor sales bans were lifted and they had the smell of uh, blood and alcohol almost immediately. And um, I'm just trying to see. And we live in a country where 69% of people are non-drinkers. So, you know, it's, un you know it, we would have expected to have seen more non-drinkers coming to the trauma units if you were just lift increasing mobility and, um, and so on. There's also the argument that most trauma is affected by mobility. It can't explain why there were zero cases of trauma in Chris Harney Baraguan of hospital over New Year. Does that mean no one was moving around over New Year? I, I think a more plausible explanation is that there was, there was probably less alcohol available. And then finally, using the paper by, by Kai Barron et al., um, we, we looked at non-natural deaths and, and, and um, the liquor sales bans. And we found that um, we looked at the impact of changing the curfew by one hour, and in fact found that there was only one one more um, non-natural death when you increase the uh, the curfew by one hour from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, and each non-natural death probably translates to 25 approximately 25 trauma admissions. So really, you can't explain all of what's going on by, by causality, but I can't go into all the details right now on that. This next slide shows data from the Medical Research Council's weekly death data from unnatural causes. The darker brown line is, is the predicted line of unnatural deaths in South Africa using data from prior years. The dotted line is a 95% confidence interval. So if things had gone according to expectations, the the, the non-natural deaths or unnatural deaths would have 
it's been sitting quite close to the dark brown line. But in reality, what you see is the black line is the actual number of unnatural deaths, which occurred over, over 2020 and into 2021. And you'll see the line drops dramatically when we've got the full liquor sales bans, which were the two, the three red periods. So there's certainly a relationship between the bans and uh, contend partly uh, restrictions on mobility, but dramatic effects when the liquor sales bans, the full liquor sales bans were imposed. So, um, look, keeping track of time, um, this is the paper which is available. There's a link at the bottom. I don't know if you can see it. I just want to ref refer briefly to the abstract. On, on July the 13th, 2020, a, a complete nationwide ban was placed on the sale and transport of alcohol in South Africa. This is the second liquor sales ban. This paper evaluates the impact of the sudden and unexpected five-week alcohol prohibition. It's a prohibition on sales. You could still drink alcohol and, and brew your own in South Africa. It's the effect of this ban on sales on mortality due to unnatural causes. We find that the policy reduced the number of unnatural deaths by 21 per day, or approximately 750 over the five week, 740 over the five week period. This constitutes a 14% decrease in the total number of deaths due to unnatural causes. We argue this represents a lower bound on the impact of alcohol on short run mortality and underscores the severe influence that alcohol has on society, even in the short run. And in fact, the impact was mostly on 15 to 34 year old males. Only one of those deaths was, uh, was so-called saved amongst females. So I want to reflect, I've been living this during the last uh, sort of nine, nine, 10, 12 months, what's been going on in South Africa around the uh, COVID-19 and alcohol and trauma. And I've been reflecting on lessons learned from the temporary liquor sales ban. I just want to share with you eight of those lessons very briefly. I think it exposed the culture of heavy drinking in South Africa, and I've talked about this, and the dependence of many drinkers on alcohol, and also the dependence of large parts of the alcohol industry and trade on heavy drinking. I think we, we were aware of it, but it just became clearer in, in some of our minds that this is the issue that has to be addressed. We have to normalize drinking. We have to normalize the drinking environment in South Africa. It raised attention on the burden of heavy use of alcohol in South Africa in terms of trauma and non-natural deaths. And it was very interesting that the president of this country, in contrast to other countries, indicated that alcohol is not an essential product. And he highlights the close links between alcohol use and gender-based violence. And previously, we had seen a much closer relationship between the government and the liquor industry. And it, would, it was highly unlikely that the government would say that alcohol isn't an essential product. So it was very interesting to see the shift taking place. I think it showed that change is possible by revealing the effectiveness of a single regulatory measure in dramatically, well, Single in dramatically reducing trauma presentations, obviously accompanied by some of these restrictions on mobility, on, on trauma presentations and non-natural deaths, and it raised questions about the impact of a basket of less restrictive leg regulatory interventions. This is quite a blunt tool, the uh, liquor sales ban. It collects everybody in its in its in its way, and I think we. You know, we need, and I've been saying this all along, we need to find less restrictive measures that will really target heavy drinking. For example, heavy drinking does not occur, for example, in, in restaurants, but yet they're affected by the same, uh, the same uh, restrictions as, as other drinking outlets. It raised questions about the kind of society in which we wish to live, free from the weight of alcohol-related deaths and disability, and how we could create a new normal. People talked about how different things were. They, people who lived next to um, Shabins, for example, thought how quiet it was. They weren't going on into late into the night. There was less, less disturbances in the streets and, and how that was an improvement in, in life in the living circumstances of, of people in those surrounds. It exposed weaknesses in our alcohol regulatory environment and our dependence on industry self-regulation. 
and focused attention on the need for the state to strengthen its regulatory measures and their enforcement and to take a tougher, tougher stance on the commercial determinants of, of, of alcohol-related harms. And I think we're seeing that. We're seeing talk now about the, uh, about the government moving ahead with, for example, the liquor, liquor amendment bill. And it finally, it, 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 uh, it, it highlighted we're in this together. While the impacts are not the same, we're all affected by government's policies to lessen heavy use of alcohol and to reduce the negative impacts. It's in most people's interest to try to create a new normal. It's only in the interests of those who really make a living out of heavy drinking to allow the current situation to, to occur. And finally, it's highlighted gaps in the way in which we collect and report on death and trauma data. And I think really one of the things I've been pushing now is we need to collect better data on alcohol-related trauma presentations. We've got data on trauma presentations, particularly in the Western Cape. We're starting to build the surveillance system for other parts of the country, but really we need better information on alcohol-relatedness, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So I'm almost done. So what strategies should we talk about to create a safer, I don't like to talk about responsible drinking, a safer drinking environment in South Africa in the long term. And for me, that has been the, the main issue. We're not thinking short term, COVID may be around for another year. What, how do we sort this out? I've been working in the alcohol policy space in South Africa for, for almost 30 years. What can we do differently? And, and there's now talk, talk about this. I was on a webinar two days ago um, with the Premier of the Western Cape, and he's talking about implementing some of these strategies. There's starting to be traction about saying, you know what, it can't be business as usual. Um, it, it can't, we can't have that. So first of all, just to mention the World Health Organization has a five-point strategy around addressing the availability of alcohol, uh, improving drink driving countermeasures, having screening, brief treatment, brief interventions and treatment, looking at restrictions on alcohol advertising and raising prices. It's interesting today, I just saw before I came on and I put, I put up a tweet, uh, the Tito Mbaweni has not listened to South African breweries' request to reduce the excise tax. In fact, he's increased it, uh, the taxes on beer by 3.8% above inflation. The same for wine and spirits. And um, so, um, we're seeing an increase above inflation, an 8% uh, increase in excise tax on uh, alcohol um, in today's budget speech, which is approximately a 3.84% 3 above inflation increase. So the government is taking something seriously, but there's other things that need to be done. So what are my steps? I'm, I apologize for this, but I, there's no way for me to get through this any quicker. Um, steps to chart a healthier way forward for alcohol in South Africa. This is a table that I've been working on over the last eight to 10 months. It keeps changing, but my points here relate to those five areas of the WHO safer strategy. So we have to do certain things around reducing the availability of alcohol. Availability increases consumption and consumption increases use. So for example, um, yeah, this was, this was, um, we should limit the quantities purchased per person at a particular outlet per day to make it harder to purchase for on selling without a license. We have a lot of people who are being purchasing their alcohol from outlets which are unregulated. So we're not here talking about, well, you can't buy two cases of, of, of wine, for example, or two boxes of wine. We're talking about stopping the sale from licensed outlets of huge quantities of liquor to one person who's clearly going to be selling on selling without a license. So that, that needs to stop controlling those kind of volumes. I won't pick up all of them. You can read them. I'll pick up the most important ones. Tracking and tracing of alcohol products. We need to put QR codes on containers um, as a way to track when you get alcohol being sold from an illegal outlet or there's alcohol at the site of a of a, a crime or drink driving maybe there's alcohol in a bottle a, a bottle in a car you can scan it with a qr code and you can find out where it came from all along the way and um yeah i'll talk more about how that was useful in russia because we 
We do have quite a lot of alcohol that's sold through unregulated outlets. We have counterfeit products. We have home brewed products which are sold to people and not just consumed locally by, by the person or family. And we really need to ensure that alcohol is sold in a regulated way. And, and, and certainly there's an increasing belief that tracking and tracing is one way to prevent such illegal selling counterfeit products and so on. Another idea is raising the drinking age uh, to 21. I, I have, I've said maybe it should be raised first to 19. In high risk context, we should look at reducing sales hours, for example, in residential areas or areas where there has been shown, we can, do, we can now have heat maps to show where there's alcohol rated harm. And in those areas, perhaps reduce the hours of which alcohol can be sold for, for on consumption. We need to bring more outlets into the regulated market and close down those that have no chance of ever becoming regulated. Yeah, looking at uh, decisions about granting license, look at outlet densities, uh, increased license fees according to the volume of alcohol sold. Currently in the Western Cape, for example, you pay four to 5,000 Rand for a liquor license for on and off sales, whether you are macro or ultra liquors selling tens of thousands of liters, hundreds of thousands of liters, or you are a small liquor outlet in Google to you pay the same fee. That doesn't seem right. And I think the fees should increase depending on the volume, past volume, and the fees can be used to pay for better inspections. We can have a much more controlled environment. It's currently the wild west in, in many environments. Drink driving, uh, there's talk about dropping the drink driving levels. I think it should only be dropped to 0.02, but we certainly need enforcement. Restrictions on advertising. Currently, we only have self-regulation by the industry, which doesn't work. Um, I think we should either have no marketing of alcohol except at points of sale, or certainly just restrict no lifestyle marketing, which bears no relationship to the actual product it's, itself. And we need pre-vetting of adverts if we're going to allow adverts by a neutral body, not by the liquor industry. And some more controls on digital marketing. Pricing, we've got problems with our excise tax. It should be more based on the grams of absolute alcohol. Currently, beer and wine are undertaxed compared to spirits. And the tax in real terms has dropped dramatically compared to what it was in the 1970s. And then a new idea, which is getting increasing traction. And there is one paper coming out in the South African Medical Journal in the next few months. And we have a paper which is under review at an international journal looking at minimum unit pricing, which is setting a minimum floor price for alcohol in South Africa. I think we should be looking, for example, at five, at seven rand per standard 12 grams of alcohol. And that would translate to a minimum price, for example, of 44 rand, a 750 ml bottle of wine or 19 rand, 19 rand 25 for a quart of beer. That's the price below which which a quart of beer shouldn't be sold. Um, it's currently sold. I went to a tavern last week in Guguletu for 16 rand. So I think we, there's certainly research showing that increasing the minimum sales price does have an impact on heavy drinking. And in fact, one of the papers looks at the link between price, minimum unit pricing and reducing harms and treatment, brief treatment and, and referral to, to yeah, brief, brief screening and referral to treatment. Last two slides, what else? I think we clearly have gaps in legislation. The Liquor Products Amendment Bill by the Department of Agriculture was sent by the president last year to the House of Traditional Leaders. I don't know why it's taken them so long to go through this bill. This bill deals with what is alcohol and it brings ales and beer more into the regulated market. There's no reason for holding this up. It's, it's, it's a travesty. And the 2017 Liquor Amendment Bill is quite far reaching. It's, it has been discussions on it, and there's no reason why the Department of Trade and Industry is continuing to hold back on moving on this legislation. And I hear there are plans to, to move ahead with it. We need smart, empowered leadership. We need to deal with the diffusion of responsibility between government departments. We need consistent enforcement of regulations and we need adequate funding to see that things get done. Uh, I believe we need to limit the, the role of the liquor industry in the alcohol policy decision-making due to substantial conflicts of interest. Certainly the liquor industry can submit their own proposals and comment on plans. There should certainly be dialogue with the industry to get their inputs, but given there's a vested interest, 
um, the industry's main job is selling alcohol, making money for their stakeholders. And we've seen the, the links they've gone to, to try and uh, get their business back and get things back to where they were. And I think we should have dialogue with industry, but not partnerships. And as I've said, we need improved surveillance. If you can't measure something, you can't really see how well you're doing. And we, we have to start. And I think the starting point is to measure alcohol-related trauma. There's a, a tool there called the Alco Stick, and it's used in accident emergency in some uh, UK hospitals. It's like a finger prick test. You have that for glucose, blood glucose, little prick, not very sore. You put it you put it on a, on, a, on a certain place and you can tell what the blood alcohol level is. And we should be measuring that at least at Sentinel sites. So we can see, we can get a better understanding of the impact of alcohol on trauma. And in fact, uh, broadly the impact, impact of, of policy changes on, on, um, on how well we're doing in, in policy shifts, control policies. Final slide. Is there an example of when this has worked? Am I just talking pie in the sky? There's a Russian example in the, in the um, let's look at the graph on the right. What it shows over time is you've got the dotted line, which is consumption and the black line is life expectancy. And what you'll see is from the early 2000, um, well, uh, life expectancy was very low around 2002 at 65 years on average, but and and the consumption of alcohol was um, was 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 at its highest. And then through implementing a number of policy measures, there's no magic bullet. The consumption of alcohol came down, and the life expectancy gone up gone up. So what were those interventions? They gradually increased the excise taxes on alcohol, something that certainly happened today. Happened today. They introduced a minimum unit price, firstly on vodka, as far back as 2003, and then they increased the minimum price, which is the floor price below which those products can't be sold over the years, and they expanded to other products. They introduced a real-time tracking system on the production and sale of alcohol. They began a comprehensive nighttime ban on off-premise sales of alcohol nationally, with even stricter restrictions on alcohol availability that's on consumption sales in some regions, as well as strict policies on alcohol-free public spaces and restrictions also on marketing. And they reaped a, a, a major benefit here. So with that, I will end and hand back to um, Hand back to Roger. Uh, Professor Perry, thank you so much. You um, uh, gave us so much to think about and um, what an excellent presentation. And wow, um, thank you very, very much for a very um, precise and um, in insightful talk. Um, I'm, I'm going to pose uh, two questions that were asked, um, and we, we do have a little bit of time. Um, the first one came from a Subendran uh, Naidu, and it was, um, a support groups like AA are essential in providing ongoing support. Currently, there are only online meetings available. Surely AA support groups are essential services. How do we get government to recognize the role of support groups as essential services. Okay, you want me to deal with them one by one? Please, yeah. Okay, um, as I said, that's not the focus, but I'm happy to engage with it. I think it is part of the picture. If you looked at the World Health Organization's, and there's you know strategies, and those are based on evidence, and that's why they're important. But I didn't go into too much on on treatment, but I think it's it's crucial because certain people. Um, do experience, you know, we probably about 6% of adults in South Africa have some kind of dependence on alcohol and they need some support. And certainly AA and self-help groups plays an enormous role, 12-step programs in helping people to, to um, deal with, 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 you know, not, not on their own, but to deal with their, their dependence on alcohol. And it, obviously some people need detoxification, other medications perhaps to get them to the point where they can, they can start um, these self-help programs. So how do we, how do we make it essential? Um, I think certainly um, 
you know, there is data. I know AA is, uh, has done has done studies, and there's a book out on the the value of AA and the importance of it. And I think we need to we need to raise that, and we need to um, get government to to be aware that this is an important component. It is, yes, it's about raising prices, it's about controlling marketing, it's about reducing availability, but there's a substantial number of people who are experiencing problems. And it's been a travesty that we really haven't done much more about that during COVID-19. So um, I think it's, it's public relations, it's putting on the table where there's strong evidence. I think we're all, we all have to sell, sell these things more. We need people who, who've been successful in AA to speak more. Um, I, I, I'm on Twitter quite a bit and I, I see people, you know, it's posting, you know, I, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm three years free or I'm 30 days free or I'm one day free. And I think that's, that's great, great, but they don't tend to say how they get free. So I think those people who, who have had success from, from AA, we need, to, we need to engage with the media. Um, there's certain media sources like Daily Maverick. You can write, you can write your own article there. And I would encourage people who, who found AA useful to, to use media, to use Twitter, and also to request meetings with, for example, the, the Premier of the Western Cape, uh, there's the, the, you know, the Minister of Health, National Health, Social, the Minister of Social Development, and, and really make the case that these need to be su supported and, and funded if needed or, or made available. So they, they're not just more in urban areas, you can also find them in, in rural areas. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, great, great advice. Um, the second question I'm going to pose is one I have for myself, and it, di it relates directly to the, the steps you mentioned in the, the chart, um, uh, uh, steps on how to chart a healthier way forward for alcohol in South Africa. Um, are we aware of any of those steps um, currently being considered by the South African government? Okay, let me, fortunately I have a printout, a small printout, which I'll try and read, it's even smaller than my slides. So, um, I, I, I don't know everywhere nationally, some of it I'll know for the Western Cape, so you bear with me, I, I, I work in the Western Cape, but I do have a national profile. Limiting the quantities that can be sold, certainly the Western Cape government is trying to, has, has plans as part of its revisions of its Western Cape Liquor Act to to do some, to institute controls so that you can't sell huge volumes off to an unlicensed. You have to, there's gonna be some tracking system so that there'll be a record of the sales of alcohol over a certain amount. You have to keep a, a record of that and that'll be somehow be captured and gone through at some point. Um, sorry, it's very small here. Um, deliveries, I, I've said that deliveries need to take place by, a, by a, a driver who works for an outlet that's got a liquor license with something to lose. I have a problem with Mr. Delivery and Uber Eats because those, as far as I know, those, those outlets don't have anything to lose particularly by they don't they can't lose the liquor license so there needs to be some way if they sell for example to someone who's 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 underage um, the QR codes um, that's tracking and tracing um, also being discussed by the Western Cape premier and I know that the, the um, South African alcohol policy alliance is lobbying but I don't know of any plans at a national level to do that. Uh, raising the drinking age, that's part of the liquor amendment bill. So certainly the government is talking quite a lot about at a national level. That's a national competency. Stricter hours in high risk contexts, that's always available for the provinces because they have control over hours. But I don't know if anybody particularly trying to do that. Um, there was a bit of talk about that two days ago when we were talking with the Premier on uh, Newsroom Africa. Bringing more outlets into the, unreg into the regulated market, uh, not hearing too much about that, bringing the shabines. Some, of, some areas, there's, there's not enough liquor outlets and you can only con it's easy to control people who are regulated. So, so that's, there's not much talk about that. Increasing licensing fees according to volume, that's just my idea that I'm trying to float. Um, Drink driving, the, the Department of Transport uh, the, in March 2020 approved the road traffic amendment bill and there's plans later this year to, to institute that to drop the, the um, BA, maximum BAC to zero. I think it should be 0.02. I also don't think we should be making criminals of everybody. So I think we should make it a administrative fine between 0.02 and 0.05, but then in, con 
continue with criminal sanctions over people driving 0.05. And also you've obviously got to have enforcement, otherwise it's not going to work. Um, marketing restrictions, I haven't heard much. There's the 2013 Control of Marketing of Alcoholic Beverages Bill, which has been stalled and I don't think it's going anywhere. But there are some talks about more restrictions on marketing in the 2017 Liquor Amendment Bill, which is being revived. So there might be something happening there. Containers of beer. Our research in Gauteng showed that when you drink from a bigger, for example, you've got a big glass of wine in a restaurant, you'll drink more. Or if you're drinking from a quart of beer versus a small one, you're going to be more likely to be a heavy drinker. There's no talk about doing that, but I think minimum unit pricing will partly solve that problem if that gets going. Uh, labeling of alcohol products, also there's not much here. I think we need to have standard drinks. When I went to the a tavern and a, a a liquor outlet in Guguletu last week, some of the people I spoke to, even from the Western Cape Liquor Traders Organization and the National Liquor Traders Organization, didn't know what a standard drink was. And I certainly think that 12 grams of absolute alcohol, in fact, it probably in the UK, it's 10 grams, many other countries, it's even eight grams. People need to know how many standard drinks they're drinking. And I think on containers, you should indicate the calories and the standard drinks, but there's no plan to do that. But Department of Health is looking at real at the labels again on alcohol containers because there was they were going to implement them but then there was a pushback from from the US and from liquor traders uh, and so they had to they're going to redo that um, excise taxes well we're seeing today they're increasing excise taxes above inflation uh, minimum unit pricing um, there's, we're going to lobby hard for that. Certainly the Western Cape is looking quite seriously at that. And uh, um, the screening um, the screening at, at, uh, of alcohol, I keep pushing that. And I think we might be trialing that in the Western Cape. Treatment and brief intervention, we're not hearing enough about that. So ISIP and others, hopefully you'll keep pushing that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, we'd love to hear more about what is happening in the Western Cape because it certainly seems like there is talk around that. Um, so it's, it just remains for me to say a very big thank you to you, Professor Perry, for availing your um, time and your expertise on this um, topic and um, presenting what was a very insightful and informative presentation. And we look forward to um, being able to invite you back um, or some of your colleagues um, to present more on the work that is happening and the research that is happening in South Africa. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. And and next time we can speak on, on some of the, maybe get Bronwyn Myers to speak on, on what's happening around COVID and mental health and treatment needs and how people are doing. That, that would be fantastic. And we, we definitely will have uh, Professor Myers. We, we are aware of her and um, absolutely. So thank you for that suggestion, yes. And thank you to the attendees and the audience for joining us today. We are very, very grateful for your um, participation. Um, please look out for the um, recording of this webinar, which will be posted in due course on our um, website and our YouTube channel. And, and please feel free to um, let us know if there's any topics you feel would be um, interested or, or, or you'd be interested in us following up in terms of upcoming webinars. Thank you very, very much. And please look after yourself and stay safe. Thank you.